Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Hello and welcome to Looking at the Markets with David Modell. I'm a fan of under-the-radar opportunities and especially medical and scientific research that supports certain companies that are on the verge of a breakthrough. And today I'll be speaking with what I believe is one of those companies. I'll be speaking with Mr. Pana Sharma, the CEO, President, and Director of Lantern Pharma. This is so exciting. Uh, Mr. Sharma, welcome to Looking at the Markets, sir. Uh, David, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I really believe in your company, Lantern Pharma, a clinical stage oncology biotech using artificial intelligence and genomics to innovate the rescue, revitalization, and development of precision cancer therapeutics. And before we start, if people are interested in learning more, I recommend that you visit lanternpharma.com. And I'll put a link in the description below this video. Uh, also, if you're interested in investing, that's up to you. You have to make your own decisions, do your research, but the stock ticker is L. T R N. Uh, so, Mr. Sharma, I don't see many biotech companies really leveraging the full potential of AI, artificial intelligence. So, could you please tell me about Lantern's proprietary AI platform known as RADR or Radar? Yeah, absolutely. Good. It's a good observation, uh, David. I think a lot of companies in the biotech space are beginning to use data increasingly to better understand what patients will respond. They're beginning to use data and some machine learning techniques to better target uh, diseases earlier. But we're very much still in the early phases of how AI and machine learning will totally transform the development of drugs. COVID-19 was a, unfortunately a wonderful example to have vaccines come out in a year. It's notable that both vaccines that were the first out Moderna and BioNT with Pfizer were both largely driven by computational virology approaches. So computing played a huge part in understanding what messenger RNA could be used to better uh, target and you know drive the response to the vaccines. And so, yes, we're in the early phases. We're a handful of companies that are really using machine learning and data to transform the process to deliver drugs faster and very importantly, with lower risk, oncology drug development is a notoriously complex, very expensive process. And ultimately, really, it's a process that should be its begging for AI because there's so much data now that we have on different types of cancer, on how different compounds and drug classes drive response. There's so many better biological tools to better monitor and measure the type of response, both in vitro as well as in vivo systems. So we're living, you know, what I oftentimes call a golden age of AI in medicine. I think the productivity is going to increase a hundredfold in the next five to 10 years. And the number of medicines that are going to be more powerful and more personalized will also increase significantly in the next decade. Uh, now, how does Lantern rescue, revitalize, and develop abandoned or failed cancer drugs? Yeah, that is great question because that's core to our mission uh, to develop drugs faster and cheaper. So many drugs, as some of your viewers may know, and many people in the biotech industry, oftentimes get abandoned because there's a lack of sufficient understanding about how that drug works. Or there's data about patients that respond really well to a drug in a trial, but unfortunately, there's not enough patients that respond. And what drives that response or that lack of response is oftentimes the genomics of the patient or the tumor or the biomarkers that are involved in accelerating or decelerating the cancer. And so that ultimately really is a biomarker phenomenon. And if you can understand the biomarkers so that you can predict responders better, um, you could have a higher chance of success. And that's ultimately how the company got started was our ability to uh, do large-scale data analytics around the genomics of responding groups and non-responding groups and generate signatures that correlated to a specific drug or drug class. 
And the very first drug uh, that the company rescued was using that method, automating data analysis around RNA signatures correlating to drug response. Uh, we've now accelerated that platform significantly from um, less than 10 million data points when I got to the company to today it's over 1.2 billion, expected to grow to over 5 billion uh, this year. And so it does not only predicting patient response, but now the functionality has increased significantly. But the core of it really is, you know, really, really highly curated data that um, we continue to collect both internally and externally. And as that data grows, the capabilities of the platform are also growing. The signatures become more robust. The types of cancers it's able to predict become more numerous. And the drug classes that it better understands um, also become much more precise. So on all three measures, I think this is probably the world's largest oncology drug development platform using AI today. Can you please tell me about Lantern's new antibody antibody drug conjugate program? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. This is a very, very important area in cancer drug development. Um, a lot of the biggest deals in cancer drug development in the last a uh, few months have all been done in the ADC space. Uh, several multi-billion dollar deals, including Gilead's acquisition of Immunomedics, uh, Merck's acquisition of Velos Bio, and Boringer Ingelheim's acquisition of MBE Therapeutics. And the reason people are so excited about antibody drug conjugates is that you're able to take these very powerful toxic uh, or even targeted payloads and direct them to specific sites in the body or specific sites of the cancer cell. So you significantly reduce the amount of side effects or toxicity, and you increase the ability to target. So you get really both phenomena. You get the best of the antibody world plus the best of these targeted uh, ther small molecule pe uh, therapeutics. The key has been the linker strategy and how you develop linkers that are programmable and more importantly that, that you can predict. And um, that is part of a big solution that we're able to solve with one of our partners, uh, Califia. But at the same time, the key and what came out of radar is as we generated more and more data, as we studied our compound, one of our very powerful compounds, 184, it became clear that that compound could better target the cancers and drive a more meaningful response if we're able to go after certain targets. And those targets, in many cases, were able to get to via an antibody. And so it was clear we had defined you know, very, very clear about eight to 20 targets that were top priority. We knew these targets would respond to these known antibodies. We knew that the payload of 184, once it got to those targets, would have a very, very powerful potent effect on killing off the cancer cells at the nanomolarity level. So it really was a perfect combination of, we had access to linker libraries, we've already identified the targets through radar, and we better understood our lead molecule 184. So as all three things came together, it was clear that this was a perfect storm for developing an ideal antibody drug conjugate. And we think that's going to generate tons of um, return for our investors, but more importantly, uh, a better therapeutic for cancer patients. Absolutely. Now, there's new and exciting scientific data substantiating the blood-brain barrier permeability of LP-184, which targets glioblastoma, an aggressive, malignant form of brain cancer. So what is the significance of this data? It's uh, really significant on three measures. First, you know, just talking from an internal perspective, um, glioblastoma was predicted to be very um, responsive to our drug, LP-184, um, by radar. It came up on several of the screens that we did. And so when we validated that, in fact, it did work, um, we were quite excited by that. It really showed us that the platform was becoming more powerful. We then ran a number of algorithms to predict its blood-brain barrier because it's one thing to kill uh, brain cancer in a, in, a, in a plate. It's another thing to do it in a real living system in, in small animals, eventually humans, but in actual in vivo intact neurospheres. So when we took our predictions and then went to the lab to use this um, in vivo and in 3D systems, and it had the same potency and across the blood-brain barrier, and it has to do two things. It has to cross the blood-brain barrier and kill off the cancer cells in this 
you know, in, in the highly potent manner that it did in vitro. And it did that. So that was a great check mark. But also, very importantly, and this is when many drugs fail, as it crosses the blood brain barrier, it has to also leave the neuronal cells intact and kill off the cancer, uh, which typically grows in glioma cells. And it did that. So the fact that it crossed the, bar crossed the barrier with a high level of potency, and then second, it left the neuronal cells intact, leaving them viable to minimize any damage to the patient, really critical. And so we crossed both those thresholds literally within months of going public and had some compelling data. And this drove uh, a lot of excitement in the team. But more importantly, for cancer patients, this is even more important because um, glioblastoma, about 50% of patients don't respond to the existing standard of care today. And their outcome is very poor. I mean, typically we're talking uh, survivals that are you know right around a year or slightly longer. So... Um, it's there's a real need for improved therapeutics in this category. Yeah. Now, in developing LP-184, Lantern Pharma has research partnerships with several highly recognized research centers. Can you tell me more about this, please? Yeah. So our, our business model is, you know, we're really good at coming up with innovations and using data and AI to advance therapeutics. Um, and we want to continue doing that. But who's going to validate that what we're doing is really actually as exciting as it should be? So our business model has been, let's make sure that we're an asset light organization, that we can use all these wonderful research labs that are always going to be better than our people, I think, because that's what they're focused in on their whole lives, professional careers. And so as we have results, we share this with the scientific community. And we were lucky enough to have some of the top research universities, including Johns Hopkins um, the Brain Cancer Institute there at Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, Georgetown, Fox Chase Cancer Center, Temple Health, we top tier research centers that wanted to participate and help um, with our research and take it to patients more rapidly. So working alongside top researchers to validate what we're doing is very exciting to help us drive new insights and drive new data that we can put into our system. And third, to better accelerate the route to patients because since they are seeing patients you know they have a much more um, in tune understanding of where this drug will fit in in terms of the armament against that disease so for our number one our investors i'm excited because it validates the top tier places want to participate and number two i'm really excited from a patient perspective because it gives us better insight in terms of how our development will get to market faster for these patients so on both fronts um working alongside top universities and cancer centers is a central part of our strategy. Absolutely. Now, Lantern also has a promising treatment candidate in LP300, which targets lung cancers for non-smokers. And a prior phase, tr phase three clinical trial of LP300 did not meet clinical efficacy endpoints, but it did demonstrate survival benefit in a patient subgroup. So how is Lantern Pharma developing this potentially life-saving treatment today? Uh, that's a very good question, David. So just for your audience, so the prior phase two trial was not done at Lantern. So this is part of our strategy. So a really interesting, innovative company called Bionumeric was advancing this molecule and they took it to phase three. So this is done in over 10 trials, that over a thousand patients, very well tolerated molecule. Um, and in a phase three trial in non-small cell lung cancer, it was observed that the non-smokers and particularly the female non-smokers, uh, both groups, both cohorts, had an increase in two-year survival of over 125%. This was very similar to what they also observed in a, in a prior phase two trial. So we had two trials where the, a group of um, non-smokers were observed to have significant clinical benefit um, with you know, really uh, statistically very significant. But at the time, there wasn't enough known about why, and there certainly wasn't the personalization of treatment done um, back in 2013 when uh, this trial was parked. And so today, we understand that non-smokers, in fact, have a very different type of disease in non-small cell lung cancer. It has a totally different molecular profile. Um, it has a different... Um, um, responsiveness to immunotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapies. And so it's a different disease. 
So now we can go back in our platform and through genomics and biomarker analysis, we can understand why that this disease is different and why non-smokers are different from smokers and the mutational profile, the site of mutation is different. And so of course it's gonna have a different outcome. So uh, once we acquired the drug, the rights to the drug from Bionumeric, we did a whole host of additional uh, lab work and study on the molecule to target what specifically was driving this increased response. And when we develop our signatures, we look for two things. Is it statistically meaningful or very significant? Um, and then that's not enough. It has to have biological relevance. You know, is the biology behind what we're finding relevant? Then third, can we replicate the biology and then continue to add to the data set that drives a prediction? And then we talk to KOL, so much like our model, you know, we have this interesting insight. We think we're, then we go talk to the top researchers in the field. And unlike 2013, today in 2021, there are many groups that are very, very um, focused on non-smokers. It's a rising disease. It's about 20% of non-small cell lung cancer. So it's not a trivial population, about 2.4 to $2.5 billion, David, that are spent annually on therapeutic options for non-smokers uh, with non-small cell lung cancer, most of them which aren't that effective. So this is a really, again, a needed area where applying AI to understand the problem and understand the genomics allows us to really rescue this drug. Um, and so we're launching a phase two uh, trial later this year. And uh, so we've been working with sites, we've been finalizing the protocol, we're obviously manufacturing, uh, we're near uh, finalizing the manufacturing of the drug. So all things kind of pointed toward, you know, uh, a mid-year, late summer kind of launch for this trial very important indication and very important to uh, uh, patients as well as to our business model. And can you please tell me about what you envision as the future of RADR or radar technology? Oh, yeah, I think we've got so much activity going on this year. We're going to add billions of more data points to the platform. Um, we're also going to grow the platform in terms of new drug classes. As I mentioned, the antibody drug conjugate program will generate tons of new data. Um, so I think easily this year we'll reach three to five billion data points and it could be um, significantly higher than that. Um, and, you know, now we're very well capitalized. We just did a follow on offering, raising an additional uh, $60 million. So we've raised 86.3 million uh, since going public. Our burn rate is very modest. So that gives us a very, very good window into, the, you know, accelerating our work into the future, several years of cash. And so we can really focus on the science, advancing the portfolio. And as we advance the portfolio, it's all data. All that data goes right back into radar. And so it really perpetuates, allows us to develop new drugs faster, new indications. And as I've promised to um, our team and to our investors, we're very focused on a new indication every 12 to 18 months. That's what we do best. We find things that are innovative, new, targeted, oftentimes in very rare, very rare populations. And then those programs can be worth hundreds of millions or potentially billions of dollars. And so this is what the power of AI is. The power of AI is to develop drugs faster, cheaper, and with greater certainty that they're going to work um, as they advance. And so I think um, this is, you know, really the future of how drug development will be done is part data science and AI and part genomics and molecular biology. I totally agree. I believe this is the future, but you get to see it first and you get to watch the future happening now with AI, artificial intelligence enhanced, and genomics technology enhanced oncology at its best. And not only new treatments, but rescuing highly promising treatments. Uh, this is really a great business model. I see it as a uh, huge potential. Uh, the t uh, ticker symbol is LTRN. If people are interested in potentially investing, now you have to make your own decisions. You don't buy something just because somebody in a video recommends it. You only invest invest after you've checked out first of all the website lanternpharma.com do your own research and then make your own decisions but my decision is that this has huge promise huge potential and possibly even life-saving i see this happening down the road uh, i've been speaking with mr pana sharma we're going to have to certainly do an update uh, at some point to check on the progress of uh, lantern pharma thank you sir for coming on looking at the markets now thank you david great to be here